You know what I got the other day, Pete? Stephen King's latest. Want to borrow it? Do you know who you're talking to? What do you mean? Andy, when's the last time I read a paper book? It's been decades. I would much rather use Kindle, or better yet, Audible. What am I thinking? I don't read paper books anymore either. I'm an audiobook guy all the way. For those looking to listen to the books behind the films that we talk about here on Movies We Like, not to mention all the other podcasts in the Next Real family, get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at thenextreel.com slash audible. There are so many great adaptations from Movies We Like available in audio form. Early on, we covered Casino Royale with director Matthew Gratzner. You went through all of the 007 books on Audible, right? I did indeed. What a series. We also covered Room with legendary D. Wallace and Never Let Me Go with costume designer Alana Morshead. We chatted about Fat City with cinematographer Sam Levy and Silver Linings Playbook with the great composer Harry Gregson Williams. 101 Dalmatians and Bambi. Apocalypse Now, There Will Be Blood, The Thin Red Line. There's so many great adaptations with so many great guests, and you can get all these as audiobooks on Audible, along with thousands of other great reads. Producing this podcast is a lot of fun, but it does take a lot of time. We have already dropped the dynamically inserted ads because they are so annoying and have no connection to our content. Plus, they just jam those things in wherever they see fit. We listened when you said you didn't like them. So now, we're directly appealing to you, our dear listener. Please, consider an Audible subscription to help support movies we like and the Next Reels family of podcasts. I've been using Audible along with my family for decades now. I love it, and I've read hundreds of books through it. Couldn't be more pleased with their service, and I know you'll love it too. Head to thenextreel.com slash audible and get your free trial. It really helps us out. And you have a world of over 200,000 audiobooks open to you. So much great material available. Dive in with a free trial and get your first free audiobook at thenextreel.com slash audible. Start listening to amazing audiobooks of your favorite movie source material with your first free audiobook today. That's thenextreel.com slash audible. Andy, I know you've never been happier than when you're sitting by a warm fire snuggled up in a flannel and basking in the glow of an old-school budget spreadsheet. (sighs) It is a special day I can shut down the world for a little me time. In a world full of applications, why do these antiquated documents and spreadsheets still run the world? And why haven't they been updated in over 50 years? That's why we want to talk about Coda. Coda is a new kind of doc that brings words, data, and teams together. It comes with a set of building blocks that anyone can combine to create a doc as powerful as an app. Coda runs our entire business here at True Story FM, from show scheduling across dozens of podcasts and scripts for thousands of episodes, to budgets and plans and wikis and more. Coda lets us see our business in a new light. If you'd like to shine a light on productivity in your business and save money along the way, check out Coda today at thenextreel.com slash Coda. Welcome to the Next Reel Speakeasy on Rashpixel.fm. I'm Andy Nelson, and that over there is Pete Wright. Hello, everybody. On the Next Reel Speakeasy, we invite a guest from the industry to join us, and instead of serving up their favorite cocktails, they serve up movies that they love so that we can all talk about them. We'd like to welcome our guest to this month's show, producer Catherine Hand. Welcome to the show, Catherine. Well, hello, Andy. Thank you for inviting me. Ah, so glad to have you on board. And Pete, 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 thank you. I'm here. Yes, I know. Chuck Liver over here. I didn't, want to, I didn't want you to feel left out. Uh, it, guys, it was a good catch. It was close. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I, was, I was almost there. So, Catherine, yeah. you've you've had a uh, a busy year um, uh, as as one of the uh, the the core creative uh, producers on the uh, A Wrinkle in Time film that came I out. I know, this year, I know. I was so excited. Is, yeah, absolutely. Before we talk a little bit about that film, though, I wanted to jump back into your past a little bit and talk about kind of how you got started in the industry and what you've been doing. So my understanding is that you actually got your start working uh, with Norman Lear back uh, I did. Back in the day. I did. I mean, it was like going to, you know, graduate school at Harvard and Yale all, all in one. You know, I, I learned so much from him. He was, you know, the king of the road, so to speak, in, in the entertainment business at the time I was working for him. And it was a real, real wonderful opportunity. So what kind of uh, things were you doing there? Well, you know, I, I first started off when the shows that he was producing, writing, directing, and not directing, but producing, um, All in the Family was on the air, Maud, Stanford and Son, all of them. And, um, and I was in the office doing administrative work. And 
And I would back up his secretary sometimes because I had worked in Washington on the Hill and worked for a senator for about a year. And so he knew I had, you know, some kind of experience. And so um, then he kind of, he would engage in conversation with me and I had been a theater major and he would send me down sometimes to give him notes. And he had a closed circuit TV in his room watching the rehearsals. And I think there was a, you know, kind of a, synchronicity, I guess, in the notes I would say and the things he was seeing. So what trust was building up. And then, um, you know, one day it just so happened that while he was making plans to leave day-to-day television and kind of pursue new endeavors, one thing led to another. And he was thinking about if the Smithsonian would want the Archie and Edith Bunker chairs and he 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 reached out to the head of publicity and said, call Kathy. And he meant another Kathy in New York. But I heard my name and I said, yes. And he said, oh, Kathy, you worked in Washington. Do you know anyone that's connected to the Smithsonian? And I said, yes, I do. And so I happened to know a late congressman from Indiana named John Bradamus, who went on to become president of New York University. And I called John and I said, John, do you think the Smithsonian would want these chairs? And he said, not only do I think they would want the chairs, I think we should plan a slew of activities, a meeting with the president, the Senate, the Congress, (laughs) and a reception at at the Smithsonian for a thousand people. So I went back to Norman and I said, well, I think he thinks that they would want them. And so um, I went from being a receptionist to event producer because of one phone call. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> and so that is I fantastic. Listen, Your career was, is an accident of naming. You would not believe it. So I, <laughs> so I went to Washington and I met with people connected to, you know, the Carter administration, the Senate, the House, working with the Smithsonian. And I actually was the person that produced all those events. No cell phone, no internet, and no team. It was me. <laughs> and, wow. um, and so it was great. I mean, it, it was all really successful. And when it was all over, Norman was really pleased. And because the, the cast came back, Norman and different executives came back for the events. The one person that didn't come was Carol O'Connor, who had, who had played Archie Bunker because Archie, he was right. ill. So, you know, it was unfortunate that he couldn't come, but everybody else did. Anyway, it was very successful. And Norman asked me if I would like to be his assistant in all of his new endeavors. And I had always wanted to be in the movie business and he wanted to go and make movies. And I was just so excited and thrilled. And it turned out that working for Norman was part show business and part politics. So I helped him create a nonprofit called People for the American Way, which kind of grew out of the research we did on the film he wanted to make called Religion. Every single day was different than the next, which was why it was so challenging and so exciting. And the incredible people that wanted to meet with him or come to see him, you know, it was really it was really an incredible, you know, once in a lifetime experience. Did did you have a sense when you started working for Norman of of just the the sort of impact that that his work was having on just on entertainment? I mean, at, at what point does that does that hit you between the eyes that that this guy is uh, is, is going to become a legend? Well, it was really funny because you know the people at the office and with Norman, you just went to work every day. Sure. It was hard. You know, it was hard and he was always, you know, t- in, a, in a wrestling with the actors or the writers, of, you know, getting it right, you know, everybody getting, being happy. And someone did an interview with him for 60 Minutes. And I remember watching that interview and thinking, wow, I work for him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shift but, in know, perspective. Yeah. yeah, but but I think um, I think also the letters that he received really made you realize what an impact he was having. And when I really understood was every single time I made a phone call to try to get in to meet with someone in the course of trying to arrange all of these events, I would just say, my name is Catherine Hand and I'm working for, I'm on calling on behalf of Norman Lear. And it was like all the doors opened. 
You know, I mean, everybody wanted to meet Norman or wanted to have a conversation with him. And the right. most interesting thing was that kind of conservative people thought he was just like Archie Bunker and liberal people thought he was just like Mike Stivic. So Norman had this incredible um, ability to kind of walk, uh, you know, to, to do the comedy in such a way that he didn't really, he offended everyone and no one. You know, everyone thought that they saw themselves in the shows that he did. And, uh, and that was his true genius, I think, that he made everyone laugh at each other. Working for Norman and in that office, we laughed a lot. You know, Norman is really oh. funny. And at least he was in those days. He was really funny. And, and so were the other writers and the actors. I mean, they would come walking in and someone would inve- inevitably fall, you know, do some sort of prank of falling or <laughs> saying something funny. And, you know, it was, it was really fun. If there's any difference that I see in when I started and my experience this past year or so is that there was so much joy and everybody yeah. in, everybody in the business in the old days came out of theater yeah. or, you know, there really weren't, there weren't even that many film schools. The AFI hadn't even been created yet when I started working there. So, you know, everybody just wanted to entertain people and make people laugh and write good things and, and, you know, push the envelope. And, and it really wasn't until about, you know, I would say 25, 30 years ago, where it started to change. And I think it started to change when people, when Jaws came out. And a lot of people thought, oh, there's a lot of money to be made in this business. Well, (laughs) certainly that did shift uh, quite a bit with the whole blockbuster scheme and and the way that that everything's kind of gone from there. Uh, Now, were you working with with Norman through all of that or by that point? Because you ended up at Embassy Pictures and American Zoetrope at a couple different places. So So I started working at Norman's office as a receptionist. That was my first job in 1976. I think all in the family (laughs) had been on. Yeah, I think all in the family had been on the air for five years. So it was on for another three while I was there. And, okay. um, and then from there, then I went to work directly just with Norman and his new endeavors um, from 79 to 83, which I think they bought Embassy Pictures. And, and then it became Embassy Pictures, Embassy Television, you know, it, it just became a very big company. From there, it's when I went up to San Francisco and I just was in the right place at the right time. And I got very lucky. And I went to work for a guy named Fred Fuchs, who was the president of Zoetrope, right as they were beginning the pre-production of Godfather 3. And I was so, I was really happy to be working on, even, even if it was a third installment, even if it wasn't as good as the first two, it was still the Godfather, you know, and, uh, and I, I just, I remember my most favorite day was um, the very first day of the very first read through. And it was at Rehearsal Hall 22 at Napa Vineyard, where Francis gathered the, t- the cast and Mario Puzo and everybody. And they all sat around this long table Diane Keaton, George Hamilton, Andy Garcia, um, Al Pacino. They were all around this long table. And then Francis opens the script and he says, exterior vatican day and i swear to god i heard the bugle or the trumpet or whatever (laughs) totally and you know what was so funny is like you know there were so many different rewrites of that script i mean geez they even had to go back and refilm it and recut it and everything but that day i thought it was perfect oh what a what a treat we've talked about that series on the show and it's just it's such a fantastic series and Uh, and the third one certainly um has its share of of uh disdain but um boy it's still such a great film it really is it is i mean you know there's just i mean he francis coppola is a master filmmaker yeah and and just to be in his presence was just a real treat and then You know, even at one point, he was interested in uh, maybe directing A Wrinkle in Time. Seriously? Let's start talking about that now. So, so how did this, how did that story enter your life and, and all of this? Because it sounds like you obviously already had 
connections to the story, A Wrinkle in Time, by the time you were working with Coppola? Oh, yeah. So basically what happened was when I was working with Norman, a friend of mine, very shortly after I started working for him, a friend of mine said, well, you know, if you had the, ch- the opportunity, what would you want to produce? And at that time, when they asked me that question, I had never thought about producing anything. And I was just, you know, trying to do, you know, read all of the scripts that Norma gave me or give him notes and all those kinds of things. And, um, and I gave him the book A Wrinkle in Time. Because what had happened was when I was a little girl, I had read the book. And immediately started a letter to Walt Disney to have him make the movie and star me as Meg. <laughs> Naturally. And, I, I love that. That's yeah. a total like, kid's, kid's dream. Like, yeah, I, mean, right. I think you it's, need to make this, Mr. Walt, and please cast me. <laughs> yeah. So um, I was too shy to send the letter. And a couple of years later, he died. And I felt really guilty that I hadn't sent him that letter. And then I thought, man, you know, I better really think of someone else to write a letter to and tell them about A Wrinkle in Time. And I just couldn't think of anyone that made movies for children other than Walt Disney. So since I knew of no one else to tell, I made a promise to myself to grow up and make the movie myself. And that was 50 Uh years ago. So you you pitched it to Norman and said... Oh, yeah, so I pitched it to Norman. Yeah, so I pitched it to Norman, and he said, well, you know, I really lo- he really loved it. And he said, you know, this, this is beautiful. This is wonderful. But it's not really something for me to write or direct. And I said, well, could I go after the rights anyway? And he said, well, you know, if you can get Alan Horn, who was then the president of his company, to agree, yes. So I sent the book to Alan. Alan read it, said he loved it. He wasn't sure how it could be made, but that I should go for it. So with that... I wrote a letter, did not hesitate. I wrote a letter, <laughs> sent it to Madeline Langle. And a few days later, I got a collect call from Madeline Langle. <laughs> and uh, she agreed to meet with me. And I was on a plane to New York. And we met. And, you know, at lunch, I, I found out that hundreds of people had wanted the rights to a wrinkle in time. And I don't know if I was just in the right place at the right time, the fact that I was the first generation of that had been exposed to a wrinkle in time and that I worked with Norman Lear and that, you know, we got along so well and my love for it was just complete and total. Uh, six months later, Norman's company had the rights with me as the champion. But then you left and, and the rights stayed kind of with you. Yeah, so what happened was um, Norman still technically owned the option. Uh But he knew how important it was to me. And so he let me pursue it and find another way, other talents, other writers, other co-partners or whatever to bring to the table and that he would then consider and and, and try and help make the, get the movie made. So it was a, it was a very complex, uh, complicated kind of situation, but it wasn't over. I mean, I was still connected to it. And then in 1989, his rights were up. But I had become by that time very close to Madeline Langle. And I didn't, I didn't have the money to option it. And she said, mm-hmm. well, you know, go and see if you can set it up elsewhere. And I will not sign a deal unless they, you are made the producer. And wow. so God, what that's what happened. Yeah. So that's what happened. And so you, you've had that kind of exclus- exclusivity kind of since then and i know the 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 one that you just did is the second version that you did yeah you did a a version like a tv version in 2003 and then you got this one done um and so i I, the 2003 one i i I, i'm assuming that you weren't as happy with it since you wanted to redo it again (laughs) yes right i think that's a fair assumption (laughs) well yeah it was it was a it's such a sweet interview this uh, this npr interview that you did and talking with with madeline too uh, when it came you know about how it it just sort of fell flat how did it fall flat for you oh let me count that way first of all budget matters you know it really matters in every facet of filmmaking visual effects were not anywhere near what they are today you know if you wanted to have really great effects you were spending millions and millions of dollars whereas today you know you can get a lot done for a lot less money but back Mm -hmm. in 2002 or one or whenever we were filming this it was uh really difficult but i think the number one problem in the very beginning was that interestingly enough i had done a deal with miramax 
And then two months after I did the deal with Miramax, Disney bought them. And then Disney at the time did not really want to, the people that were in charge didn't want to make the movie. And Bob Weinstein, who I was working with at Miramax, wouldn't give up. And he went to the head of ABC. And the head of ABC loved A Wrinkle in Time and said, yes, let's try it. They would not give us anywhere near the budget we needed unless we could make it for four hours. Well, Mm -hmm. then that meant you had to change the story a lot because it's really, you know, at the most like a two hour movie, but now we had four hours that we had to fill. So a lot of changes had to be made. And it's like anything, you know, you start making changes and then all of a sudden you have to make more changes and you have to make more changes. Yeah. The dominoes fall. Yeah. The dominoes fall, you know, so there was just so many things that really made it very difficult. You know, I think the timing was right for it to get made because I had been at it for like 20 years and I was just like exhausted. And I thought, well, I would just take this opportunity. The other though was after it was aired and everything, I just, I was so sad that it wasn't my dream. It wasn't what Madeline and I had talked about all these years. And so I really became, I was just resolved to try to get it remade as it should be. and. That was what I then tried to do for the next 10 years. What an amazing story. And then, okay, so now you ended up with this, uh, this most recent version that uh, mm-hmm. you had a, 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 a big name director, Ava DuVernay, mm-hmm. on board to direct it. Uh, and Jennifer Lee uh, as one of the writers who had done um, Frozen. Frozen. Yeah. And along with Jeff Stockwell and uh, and and uh, kind of this amazing cast: Oprah Winfrey, Reese Witherspoon, Mindy Kaling, uh, Gugu Mbatha Ra, Michael Pena, the amazing Storm Reid, uh, Zach Galifianakis, and Chris Pine, all a part of this thing. Um, how how about this one? Did it all uh, work out? I know it was quite a quite a journey to get to this, and and I've got to say, from from my perspective, from my daughter uh, watching with with the family. Um, it was really an amazing experience for us. And it's just something that my daughter really connected with. So I loved, I loved seeing that. Yeah. You know, I, I am so happy it was made. I'm very happy that Ava wanted to make it. I was extremely happy that Jennifer Lee wanted to write this screenplay. And I think overall, I was just thrilled that Disney, you know, um, Sean Bailey, the president of Disney, and our beloved executive, Tim Naginda, um, and his associate, Jessica Virtue, that they were all as committed to making a beautiful version of A Wrinkle in Time as I was. You know, it was a, it was a thrill that I was able to see this through. It was a very curious thing that I had a certain vision of the movie in my head all these years. Obviously, that's what propelled me forward. But then when you get to a place where you're working with the likes of Jennifer Lee and Ava DuVernay and, you know, Jim Whitaker, the other producer, and all the incredible talent at Disney, collaboration means that other people have to be heard and their voices can be louder than yours, you know? And um, so it was um, a wonderful experience for me to to really live through what it's like to work with, with all this talent this big studio, and to learn how to really collaborate. One of the things that was a little different is that I had read the story as a little girl and brought that young girl's vision of it. That's what I carried in my heart all these years. Sure. Ava Ava had never read it as a kid. So Mm. what she brought to it was her, her incredible talent, her experience, and that of someone that had not read it as a child, right? Well, now, Jennifer had read, yeah, an adult perspective, and Jennifer had read it as a child too. So now there was this blend. And what was so interesting is that Ava really did, I think, a beautiful job of what, I think the, the intention of the studio was to bring a wrinkle in time in the 21st century. You know, We've changed a great, we've changed a lot, you know, in the last 50, 60 years. And it was important that the language be something that meant, meant something to the, today's audience. And, and I think Jennifer and Ava really threaded a very 
difficult needle, you know, to kind of bring it into the 21st century. And I will say the, the most wonderful thing that Ava did in our very first meeting was to say she was interested, but she wanted a diverse cast. And I was very happy about that because a long, long time ago, Madeline told me her very favorite line in the book was like an eagle or not the same thing at all. And that she had always promised me, I mean, ma- you know, made me promise that that line would be in the movie. And when Ava wanted this diverse cast, I thought that embodied that sentiment that meant so much to Madeline Langle. So it was kind of like um, a synchronicity, you know? And then for the movie to come out at this time of, you know, young women's empowerment, kind of like, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to mix it up with the Me Too thing, but, you know, this age of women coming into their own and um, and kind of a renaissance for people of color in the arts and everywhere else. It's it's like it came out the way it should at the exact time it should. Yeah, and I think, like I said earlier, like my daughter really connected with it, and I love her seeing films with so many female characters with with yeah. a diverse cast of female characters that she can really connect with. And it's not even something that she thinks about when she's watching. Yeah. It. It's just an exciting group of of characters for her to go on this journey with. And I know uh, it's you know, really. I do with, think it's important. I, yeah. That's so great. I'm so glad to hear that. I think what's kind of sad is that young girls and boys um, love A Wrinkle in Time, but unfortunately, the critics are usually older uh, men and sometimes men and women. And I don't know if you you remember, um, oh gosh, what was that great movie that Robert, it's the, the Silver Bell. You know, uh, the Polar Express. Oh, the Polar, Polar Express. Polar Express. Express. You remember, yeah. you get to a certain time where you can't hear the bell anymore. Yes, You're right. <laughs> and and I think your daughter and definitely me when I read it, we could still hear that bell. Yeah. yeah. And I think a wrinkle in time appeals to the people that can still hear that bell. Well, they, those the people who can't need to see the movie with people who can because I find yeah. it absolutely contagious, and I I deeply enjoyed watching this movie with my kids because oh, you know I, so they get the same delight on their face that you know that that I do, and it reminds me of my experience reading this book, the whole series as a kid. Oh, uh, I'm it, so it is, glad. It's just delightful. I I I do have one uh, specific question that I have been told I have to ask you, uh, or I might be drummed out of the family uh, on behalf of both of my. <laughs> kids uh how could you possibly have let ant beast get cut Catherine? the floor is yours <laughs> listen i join your the members of your family <laughs> I, I i have loved ant beast my entire life you know ant beast is just this incredible character and what happens with meg the the beauty of the story that happens between Meg and Anne Beast is just part of what makes a wrinkle in time so special. You yeah. know, it, the, the language, the dialogue, everything that goes on between them is just really, really important. So I share that. Making movies is a really uh, a tough job. And sometimes really tough decisions have to be made for the sake of the movie. Madeline said in an in a conversation I had with her when we were working on the script together, because we did work on a script together. And she said, you know, Ant Beast wasn't written to be filmed. It was written yeah. to be read. Mm. So all of the stuff that we love about what goes on between Ant Beast and Meg, it's the beauty is in reading it. So when we tried to film some of it, it just didn't come across as beautiful as it did in the book. What we did not give up, you know, we, what we did not lose, and I really think that everybody involved had a hand in this, was that the whole section of Ixchel is just very important to the story when Meg realizes that she's the one to go back and not her father. Right. And she's first very angry with him that he's not saving her brother and then realizes, you know, she apologizes to him and that she wanted her father to make everything easy for her and simple and that he can't and that she's the one that has to accept what needs to be done. 
And so we did not lose that. Yes. Which right, right. I think was really, really important. So please tell your daughters and your wife that <laughs> I share your sadness, but, but I think it's a better movie that we cut it. I, I have to tell you, I personally, as a father of a 16 year old and a 12 year old, uh, was, uh, it just reminded me how deeply crushing that sequence is when the father doesn't go back for, and I was just like, oh, I need to leave the room. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I am, I am now <laughs> associated with this horrible emotion and I cannot stomach it anymore. No, but then there's this lovely, lovely moment. Between Meg and her dad, when they finally get home, yeah, and and Chris you know? Pine Storm oh Reed God. just crush so that. I mean, it's just it. yeah, I mean, it's uh, just uh, really amazing. beautiful. So you know, I mean, it kind and they got of, it Zach Galifianakis like to stand still. I mean, it was just there's so <laughs> many huge wins in this movie. Oh, it makes me, tell you, he, <laughs> I, you know, Zach Galifianakis is one of the nicest guys. Oh, he's just like a love. He's a really nice person. Oh. That's great to hear because, you know, other than that, it's between two ferns and you know, <laughs> it's a different character. Can we can we talk just a little bit about uh, about what's going on what or what went on with this movie in the box office? Because I am deeply saddened by it as a, as a money losing thing. And um, I, I don't know how to make sense of it in my heart. I do think that it is important to say that when this movie opened, that it opened, I think, at number two at the box office behind yes. Black Panther. Yeah, so it was right. the it was the the first week weekend where uh the number one and number two films were both directed by people of color which i i was yeah. so excited when i saw that news yeah oh right. it, it was it was and look i think everyone shares your disappointment obviously the people that worked really hard to bring it to the screen and who nobody knows you know yeah it, it's it's just one of those things i mean look at solo yeah mm-hmm. right, right. <laughs> who could you know but you one? You you made a point earlier, which I think is, you know, would be remiss if we didn't at least echo it, which is that, uh, you know, when you talk about the older critics who who were not as kind maybe to the movie because they, they couldn't hear the bell. Well, there is a little bit of this joyless sort of uh, ownership culture. Uh, where you know there is a there is a a population of people who believe they have ownership of certain ideas and properties as fans Mm -hmm. and when they don't agree you look at look at solo when they don't agree um you know and and what has happened horribly with uh you know with our uh rose in in the last jedi i mean this is uh this is a, a market of toxicity and i wonder if there isn't a little bit of echo uh that that impacted a wrinkle in time I would agree. <laughs> I think yeah. that, um, you know, people that love A Wrinkle in Time fiercely love it. And we're, you know, really expecting, you know, things that maybe they didn't see. And so, you know, they were vocal about that. But on the other hand, I would say that you think about this. Movies have been around for over 100 years. I don't know how many movies that means that have been made but i would guess hundreds of thousands you know pick the number but not one movie before a wrinkle in time had a 13 year old biracial girl as the lead not one Hmm. and i hope that in as we move forward that wrinkle will have a life after you know it won't won't be talked about as you know um, a disappointment at the box office. I hope we get yeah. beyond that. Yeah. And we talk about, you know, the beauty and the themes that are in A Wrinkle in Time. One month after the movie came out, A Wrinkle in Time, the book was number one on the USA Today's bestseller list. Oh, that's great. That is heartwarming. So, you know, I think, I think after all is said and done, you know, people will will speak kindly of this movie and it will have a life that we can't even imagine right now. Um, I think, you know, people didn't like um, The Wizard of Oz. The critics hated The Sound of Music. You know, they're, they're, so I think movies sometimes, even though critics today said they didn't like A Wrinkle of Time, just wait, you know, yeah. give it some time. And I think maybe it'll find another life. 
well, especially as, as our kids grow up, it'll be yeah. something that, um, you know, that they've latched onto. And it's well, more I, yeah, I was going to say, I, I can guarantee yeah, my, my kids are taking it with them, like as they grow up, I guarantee <laughs> yeah. that, right. it, you know, it, but but it also reminds me like the, the books that I felt even personally, even closer to were, you know, Wind in the Door and Swiftly Tilting Planet, like the whole for me, it was then the trilogy yeah. uh, was um, was very important. And and I think that's the, the thing that, uh, you know, I I had wished for going into this movie was that there would have been stronger momentum that would have cemented uh, a, cemented them, yeah. a yeah, series. Yeah, well, you and me both. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know, you know, maybe in time yeah. um, that'll turn around and the sequels, you know, will have a life somewhere that we can't see or predict. You know, movie business is funny. Yeah. Who knows why Truly. things get made and others don't. But, you know, I do think that... Um, it's a crazy thing how critics and certain people on social media and kind of media in general are pretty tough and harsh and uh, almost cynical. And yet the audience, the people at home, they want stories that are like A Wrinkle in Time. And it's just figuring out you know, how to reach that audience that wants to be entertained and uplifted and feel good and you know have some light come into their life and not just be bombarded with dark cynical films which Mm -hmm. then critics love right (laughs) (laughs) well yes it's it's a frustrating mix you know and and in the end, you know, the public uh, does find a way to, to uh, you know, speak their mind, even if it uh, may be decades later. You know, you all, well, you know yeah, I always think yeah. it's interesting looking at the Oscars from decades ago and, and going, well, this is the movie that won Best Picture, but this is the movie that people still talk about that came out that year. And so it's, yeah, it's right? interesting the way that things, that lives of things end up uh, lasting. Know. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, you know, to get on to our, just to segue for a moment, but... I was reading a little bit about um, the sound of music and I, I mean, the, you know, behind the scenes and it was just, you know, kind of surprising to find how many of the people that were behind the, the, the you know, the creative team uh, were so afraid that it would be perceived as, you know, saccharine and sentimental. And if anyone was associated with it, they were sorry that they were, must be really hard up for money and, you know, all that oh, kind of stuff where, hateful. you know, it turned out to be one of the most, you know, number one movies for 1965 and held that until, you know, decades later. I think Jaws was the first movie that started, or was it Jaws or Godfather? One of them. It was the first movie that started, you know, wrinkling time going down. I mean, the uh, sound of music going down on that list, but it held that number one position for decades. Well, you you did a, a nice way of of segueing uh, into the sound of music. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, re- <laughs> the reason that we're here, I mean, we were just having such a great conversation I about know. <laughs> wrinkle of time and everything. It really, it's just fascinating stuff to talk about. But yes, the reason that uh, that we did bring you here is because uh, we were talking about one of your favorite movies, The Sound of Music. So yeah, that, um, I, that I am willing to admit there are many people in the movie <laughs> business who will not admit that they love a, a, the sound of music. <laughs> you know, I, I have a theory about that. And I think it, I think it holds a little bit with films like that and the wizard of Oz that, yeah. that people grew up with seeing all the time. I mean, th- those two films were on TV every year and I watched them every year and it became right. such like a, a recurring part of our life that it's almost like when you're talking about your favorite movies, Oh, it can't be one of those because you know, yeah. I've seen those too many times and so has everybody else it has to be something uh, a little more unique or whatever it is um i i think that that it it becomes so commonplace that people in their minds they just diminish the quality of it a little bit because it's just so common yeah. but it i for me it doesn't take away kind of the grandeur and the quality of the film well you know i think what it is is that you can say Depending on where you are in your life, there are different films that were brilliant and wonderful. I mean, you know, there's a reason why Citizen Kane is rated the number one film, you know, all the time or Casablanca. But um, The Sound of Music, I think if you were having a bad day, (laughs) it's good to put The Sound of Music on because you cannot watch that movie and not feel good. 
after you finish watching the film. You know, it just makes you feel good. I think, and this is, I, I, maybe I'm, I've coined this, maybe I should, I should, uh, trademark it. I call this film a lenticular postcard film because <laughs> how many people do you know who, when you talk about the sound of music, say, oh, oh, yeah, I remember that movie. And then you remind them there are Nazis in it and they're like, wait, what? Like, <laughs> the, the whole story is about this, the, it, it's essentially Mary Poppins with no magic umbrellas yeah. and it stars Mary Poppins. And her name is Maria, and yeah. that is it is it is remembered, I think, by many as the 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 singing family movie, and not the true story uh, of, of the, the Nazis you know, of of the Nazis annexing Austria. I know, you know, it's it's you're absolutely right. Uh, it's very interesting, though. Um, William Wyler, who was the first director in in the early early days of bringing the talent together for the Sound of Music. And um, and he was working with Ernest Lehman on the screenplay. And, and I think uh, a lot of the conversation that he had really impacted the development of the screenplay. And he went on location to um, Salzburg. But he really wanted to have a, a big blow up with tanks coming in and the Nazis <laughs> taking them out. And it was like, because, you know, here was a guy that hated Nazis, you know, and, right, right. and he really wanted to show those damn Nazis, you know? And, uh, and I don't so think funny. that, uh, uh, um, Zanuck and, uh, all the uh, other people behind it really saw that right for this musical. <laughs> and so I think when William <laughs> Wyler decided not to do it, I, I think they were secretly relieved and uh, and because I think you're right. I mean, there are Nazis in it and they really did a great job of helping you forget that. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. It, until you get to the very end and you realize this is an incredibly intense sequence like yeah. this is the, the sequence in the in the cemetery is. You just, we, I mean, how many times have I seen this movie and my whole family was watching it this morning and we're literally on the edge of our seats on the edge of the couch. I know. Uh, watching this and movie. you just we wonder, know how Rolf it ends. Gonna, <laughs> yeah, it's, exactly. And you, you still wonder, is Rolf, is he going to tell? Is it gonna Yes. <laughs> Rolf, come on, man. <laughs> It gets yeah, it's so tense. And that I, as a kid, I remember just watching this, and I was just like, uh, you know, you know, my, clenching my parents. I was so tense from the scene. It's it was so terrifying. Watching as an adult, you realize how short that whole sequence is. But it's like it's such a tense ending for the film. It really well. And you know, when I was a kid, I remember being really concerned that those kids were going to talk. You know, they would cough sneeze. and that would bring oh, the Nazis that would was gonna sneeze, or, yeah. they, or they weren't going to be behind that stone and the flashlight that was, you know, behind the gate. Right, you know, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. And it is so interesting, the story of of how the whole thing came to be. I, you know, I, I've always known the story of known the songs and everything, but re doing some research on it and realizing, you know, um, uh, Maria von Trapp that, and the Trapp family singers, her husband had died. And so she kind of wrote this memoir to kind of promote the group and to try to, you know, kind of keep the, the funds coming in and everything. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, uh, and she tried to sell it to Hollywood, but Hollywood wasn't interested at the time. This was right. the late forties. And it was a German producer who ended up buying the rights and made yeah. two films that I didn't even know existed. Uh, the first one was the trap family. And the second one was the trap family in America. Right. And and it's like I had no idea that those had uh, had been in existence, and and um and I was always curious about the credit at the opening where it says with the partial use of ideas by Georg Herdelek, who I guess yeah. was one of the screenwriters for one of those versions. Well, and you know what's interesting in nineteen I think sixty one or sixty two, I saw the Von Trapp Family Singers movie. Oh, did you really? Yeah, I saw it. It was playing at the local theater. And I remember loving it, right? But I didn't, it was, a, it was a while later that I made the connection that the Von Trapp family singers, that when the sound of music wasn't a remake, you know, it's like, I thought, yeah. oh, is this a remake of the movie that I saw? But I'll tell you another little funny story when you were talking, a sad story. When Maria Von Trapp sold those rights to, was it Rudolph or Ronald um, uh, Max Reinhardt, um, she had asked for $10,000 and she had asked for um, a piece of the royalties 
And he said, well, and he's German. And he said, well, the German law is that we cannot give peace of royalty to a foreigner. And at that time, she had been made an American citizen. Oh, and, she did it, and she didn't ask her lawyer if it was true. Oh, she no. just thought he was telling the truth. So she signed the deal, got her money, <sighs> and found out that that did not exist. So if you think about this, that poor woman did not get anything because someone lied to her. I mean, it's and, basically what happened. And those two movies became the most successful films in West Germany during the post-war yeah, years. So she yeah. lost out on all that part of them. I know. It's kind of sad. But anyway, you know, listen. The, the entertainment business, as well as every other business, is filled with those kind of stories. But I always think that's so sad. Well, I didn't hear anything as far as her deal with the uh, with the U.S. because Paramount um, eventually um, bought the rights to to make this. Um, I think before it um, reverted, or and then some, they bought the rights to it, but it, then they decided to um, do the stage musical. And then 20th Century Fox ended up getting the rights to that to yeah. uh, to make the film. So I don't know if she ended up getting any part of uh, of that or not. Well, but, she did, uh, I'll I tell you so. something. Yeah, she got a, she got like uh, se- seven hundreds eight. I, it's a small fraction of one percent. But you know, mm-hmm. even that would be that would be good. And I don't know if it was of. I think it was was either of the play or the or the movie. I can't remember. One of them, she got a small percentage. Because I think they were just trying to be kind. They didn't have to. And I right, think right. they just thought it was the right thing to do. Well, I think with both of them being success, I'd like to think that it still ended up working out for her. Yes, I think In my so. head. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, oh, you know. My. But I mean, it's just such a... It's just such a beautiful movie. It's so funny, though. I did see it not too long ago, and I thought, oh, it's a little dated <laughs> you know, in the way that we make movies today. But it, there is just so much joy in it, you know? Well, it's got that kind of that magic from the 60s, the big epics that they were making back in the 60s. Yeah. You know, this was uh, uh, Robert Wise's second big epic musical that he did this decade right after West Side Story. Yeah. And so he was kind of right in the thick of it. Everybody was looking for this sort of story. Rodgers and Hammerstein had been kind of making all of these big movies and doing such a great job with them. Um, and, you know, I, I think that... Uh, this is some of their best music. I mean, the songs in this, I mean, you can just go down oh. the list of songs and, you know, every time I'm thinking about it, I'm like, Oh, well, do re me is obviously my favorite. Oh, no way. I forgot yeah. about, I forgot yeah. about the, uh, you know, my favorite things. Oh, I forgot about the goat herd song. It's like everything. Yeah. It's like, well, oh, I love all of the songs. And the thing that I love, probably one of the top five things that I love about the movie is the opening. I mean, when that yeah. just comes to the clouds and you hear the, birds and it comes through the mountains and it keeps going it looks so beautiful and the music starts to swell and it just keeps building and it keeps building and then you see this woman on the top of that hilltop (laughs) and twirls i mean it is just so thrilling you know you don't it's a bold opening it is it's very bold and um i read someplace that robert wise was um because the whole opening idea came from ernest layman and Robert Wise was concerned that it was too similar to kind of like the big opening of West Side Story. So he kind of didn't want to go there. And then Layman said, okay, we'll come up with something else. And they couldn't. So that's, <laughs> that's why they stayed with it. It wins by so default. Like, oh, well. Oh, well. <laughs> right? No, it, which, you know, it ends up being kind of a really nice bookend for the movie uh, to to have this this opening sequence that is this beautiful sort of cascading uh, sequence through the, the Alps. And then the end of the movie is the whole family now back in the Alps looking right. uh, really charming and, and happy. And the weather is lovely. And, and uh, you know, it's it's a nice bookend to what is uh, kind of a roller coaster or emotional roller coaster of a movie. Of course, the first thing my wife says as she's reading this is, yeah, I don't think the refugees looked that good crossing the Alps <laughs> on foot. I don't know, but... <laughs> well, I said, of, shush, it, shush, shut up. Nobody asked you. <laughs> yeah. Well, very true. And you know, the other thing too is, I don't know why, but somewhere, I don't know if it's in a movie, if it's in, com- you know, articles that have been written, but don't you have the feeling that they went over that mountain to Switzerland? I always, I guess I assumed so. Yeah. Okay. So 
Salzburg isn't next to Switzerland. Right. How would they, <laughs> how would that, now that you say that, I'm like, I better pull up a map because I'm right. not sure. <laughs> They did it. They went over that They're in real life down to Italy. <laughs> but oh. for some reason, I do not know why, but people have said, oh, you know, they went over to Switzerland. But it's like, no, they went to Italy. Anyway, it's just a little tidbit. <laughs> so, but, there, wow. but there are so many wonderful stories about, the, you know, the making of the movie. I think everybody involved really loved it i mean you know i think that they saw even in the early dailies that they had something very very special and uh i mean it's just kind of ironic that christopher Plummer, you know thinks it's so sentimental and he said he had to be in it and all that kind of stuff and it's kind of the role that he's most famous for it's and it's so funny hearing the stories uh, of him and and his opinions of it. You know how he would uh, make up names for it, like oh, the sound of mucus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was so disdainful of it, um, but I, I think it's just something that he's he's kind of grown to, uh, appreciate. to uh, appreciate at least deal with in a way. Yeah. You know, because I, I know like. I, I can't remember if it was Oprah or uh, Ellen or somebody, uh, some t- daily talk show did uh, like a big anniversary, like a 50th anniversary thing. And, and, you know, he finally agreed to appear after all this time of not <laughs> wanting to talk about it. And I, I, you know, I think he's kind of at a place where he's like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll grudgingly accept that I was a part of it and I'll, I'll enjoy it a little bit. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, good for him. You know, I mean, he's absolutely shown his chops in so many other movies, so he can be gracious about the sound of music, you know, but um, one time, uh, I was asked, not an interview, just by a friend, I think, you know, well, what, what was the music, you know, that you were listening to in the course of trying to get a wrinkle in time made? And I, I never wanted to admit, but I think I played Climb Every Mountain, you know, three times a day. Oh. <laughs> Because, what you know, inspiration? I was, always, That's great. I was always dealing with rejection and disappointment, and I would play that song. I have confidence on the way to work. That's what oh, I, would I play, love. That. You know? oh, I, I love I had, that. I had a, the, the tape, and because it just gave me so much um, inspiration and confidence to meet my day. And I know that it probably sounds like people want to gag when I say that, but. It was true, you know? I mean, I think I'm sad that there's so much cynicism for young people, uh, that they live in a world with so much cynicism because I was just taught to look at the glass half full and not half empty. And I think that that kind of attitude and approach to life really has guided me through everything. And on, I think movies like A Wrinkle in Time fed that attitude and approach. Sure. I mean, not sure. A Wrinkle in Time, uh, The Sound of Music. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. I, t- I talk about A Wrinkle in Time so much. <laughs> 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 but I met The Sound of Music. I think Sound of Music, you know, really, you know, it just, uh, I think it's just a really wonderful movie. And I'm not alone, you know, to think that. You know, it's funny, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, I Have Confidence in Me as, as one of the songs, and I, I didn't know this. Like, I, I, I guess I, thinking about this and, and wanting to talk about the show, I realized I had no idea, like, in my head, it's like, I, I never really kind of put two and together. I've never actually seen the stage show version of this. I've only mm-hmm. ever watched the musical. It's become right. such a part of my life that I, I kind of forgot that there was a musical that existed before this. And then you start right. looking at like all the work that Ernest Lehman did as he was adapting it and how he had to kind of switch songs from this place to that place. And and I was listening to them talk about it on the commentary and it's like, wow, the goat herd song was what Maria sings to the kids when they're scared from the thunderstorm. Yeah. Uh, my favorite things, Maria sings with the nuns. I'm like, this is crazy. Like, I can't even right? picture that version in my head. It's so weird. I know. I know. And Ernest Lehman was just, you know, and what I've read, Ernest Lehman was really the champion of this. I mean, while the studio was trying to figure it out, producer was trying, I mean, Ernest Lehman was the heart and soul of this. You know, he was the one that was trying to get Bob Wise. He thought Julie yeah. Andrews was the only one that should play it you know he he really lived and breathed the sound of music before everyone else kind of got on board and um and you know and one of the things that i read is that he was tried to be very true to the original material so i think he was looking at the play and he was looking at the books that maria had written i think he was looking at the um von trapp family singer movies 
and like taking bits and pieces from everything to see what you know would make sense one little story i read that i thought was really funny is that he actually had lunch or dinner with maria von trapp and one of the things that she said to him was that being at the abbey was so you know so strict and that she even got to the place where you know she would kiss the floor before she did anything wrong and if you <laughs> if you she used that in the movie he did he did that, right. <laughs> that moment that maria von trapp actually did is in the movie and i just love that i think that's so great did you guys did you see the cameo of maria von trapp in the movie during yeah. the I Have Confidence song. I, I, I feel like I know I, she's there, but I, I didn't know about it until afterward. I haven't gone back to look for her yet. Oh, she's way it. in the distance. Man, you need to know to look. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I feel like I watched it really close and, and I just missed it. Uh, something well, about so how she crosses into the she's arch. She's at the water fountain and oh. way in the back. She's at the water fountain, you know, I think her hand is she's spraying some water or whatever. And way in the back, there is a woman, kind of you only see her silhouette. And she's walking across the plaza, and I think with someone, and that's Maria von Trapp. And it's the like only her reason, granddaughter, I think. Yeah, yeah. and the yeah. only reason why I know is because on some uh, special, they had a kind of what do you call it, like a laser beam, <laughs> something <laughs> that they had that was showing you. Aha! See that? That's oh, Maria they had von to Trapp. point her out. Yeah, a pointer. How funny. <laughs> I love it. But it was really, it was great. That's too funny. But, um, but, you know, apparently Maria Von Trapp is a pretty powerful person. Well, and, you know, I think Julie Andrews was such a great choice to play her because I think uh, Julie Andrews, especially coming off of Mary Poppins, um, yeah. really had just so much strength. And I love the story of, of uh, when uh, Wise and Lehman found her. You know, they were watching some early test footage of Mary Poppins, which is the yeah. first thing. And Wise leaned over to Layman before they even finished. He says, let's go sign this girl before someone else sees this and grabs her. <laughs> right. you know, they were so taken by her, her screen presence. And absolutely, yeah. I think she's just a delight to watch on screen here. Oh, I mean, she's just like fantastic. And uh, it was funny years ago when she got, you remember when she got the Kennedy Center Honors, yeah. Julie Andrews. So I don't know, you know, like, like a crazy happenstance. I was in the elevator at the Kennedy Center and she was in the same elevator. And I was so excited to be in the presence of Maria. <laughs> I could, I couldn't. Usually I always say hello. You know, something. I could not, I could not say anything. Oh. It was like, oh, oh my no. God, there she is. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm sure so we all have somebody excited. like that. That were yeah, like, right? I, I just wouldn't be able to say anything. Yeah, my, the two people in my life that have actually done that to me are Julie Andrews. And once I was in an elevator with Catherine Hepburn and the exact same thing happened. I just, I was, I was just in awe. I was totally in awe and couldn't do any, say anything. Well, it, you know, what's so great about this casting too, is that Christopher Plummer, just the way he aged really pulls yeah. it off. I mean, the, the real story, uh, apparently there's a 25 year gap uh, between Maria and, and Captain Von Trapp. And in this movie, I mean, Christopher Plummer and Julie Andrews are only six years uh, difference in, in age. And yet I, I think they really, it really works. She looks so fresh faced and young and he looks, he looks just kind of aged and grizzled enough. Oh, um, I know. That, and that uh, dance really when they works. do that. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's so romantic. Yeah, so romantic. It really is. So romantic. And, there, oh you know, I, I'm telling you, I, I, <laughs> I said, I, as my, my one comment on this, a snarky comment on, on this as I was watching it is, man, The Sound of Music is the was the best season of The Bachelor, right? When he... <laughs> <laughs> when he tells the Baroness to go pound sand and goes yeah, out right. to the dark garden in the dark and says, you know, I, I, I have where well, they have their little conversation so close, so soft focus about, you yeah. know, it, I have to say I love you, you know, just yeah. couldn't say I love you to somebody and not mean it. I uh, even I uh, was uh, I, my heart skipped a beat. I was like, that's just so romantic. <laughs> I can't believe I it. I'm gonna I mean, it was it. Romantic. <laughs> and then the kids were so cute. 
Yeah, I mean, they were you know, who didn't want, I, I wanted to be one of those kids, you know, but Absolutely. I was too old. I couldn't audition. I was too old. Except but... I swear that those outfits that she makes out of the, out of the drapes, I mean, every time I watch, I'm like, Oh my God, I cannot believe anybody would wear those play clothes. Know, right? that, that they all wear them. <laughs> oh my God. The floral later hosen. I know. Later hosen made out of drapes. <laughs> oh, so you know, one thing I read that I thought was really interesting forever. I always thought Edelweiss was a true Australian folk song. I mean, I always did. And mm-hmm. then, of course, you know, you find out, no, Roger Hammerstein wrote that. But that was the very last song that Oscar Hammerstein ever wrote. And then after he wrote oh. that, um, not too long after he wrote it, he died. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, I oh, mean, that's... it's a very special song because I love that song. It's so simple. It says everything that, you know, we all feel about, you know, country we love or whatever people we country, love family all that yeah. yeah all of it and um that that was his last song that was kind well, of and, and that's another one that layman uh, expanded on in the film because in the in the play it only was ever performed at the end when they're performing at the uh, at the playhouse oh really yeah and they so did, he's did, like this song is so good we have to bring it in earlier and so that's why yeah. we have uh, the captain singing it earlier and it's like uh, thank goodness that they do because it really uh, it's oh, a perfect song yeah. for him to sing with his family yeah, because now when you when you hear it the first time, then it's even more poignant when he sings it the second time, and he knows that that's you know he's leaving, yeah. and it really catches you. I mean, it really means. And then he couldn't get through it, and she has to finish it for him. I mean, I'm telling you, they they really knew how to get you with the tears. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Can you tell I love this movie? Well, and you know what's great about the 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 what you just said with the tears and stuff is um it really struck me watching this uh this time how how kind of gracious the baroness is and how she's kind of realizing um you know this is not the right guy for me. And I couldn't help but feel like this was something that Nora Ephron had must have just watched before she wrote right. the scene in Sleepless in Seattle when Bill Pullman's character says, "You know what? I, you know, I, I am better. I'm going to go find somebody else." You know, and just the way that the breakups happened in those two films, I'm like, God, it, it was really strong. Yeah, you know, but when I when I saw that recently, I thought. That had to have been written by a man because I know of no woman that would have done that so well. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is such a textbook sort of narcissistic uh, response, right? There, there are a couple of these, just the uh, expert demonstration of narcissism and of ADHD. I mean, Maria, if she doesn't have just classic young adult ADHD, I don't know I what know, it is right? at the beginning. <laughs> it's just so good. Like, well, I, definitely I know some... you think, yeah, definitely. I mean, this is yeah. a kid, that, a woman that cannot stay still. <laughs> right. And, and yeah. even the nuns want to kick her out. Like, even yeah. the nuns. So. I know, you know. So, but it was really great. And I, I, one thing though, have you ever been to one of those um, sing alongs? It's funny that you say that. I was actually looking, um, kind of just finding out some kind of facts and tidbits about it. And I was reading about these sing along sound of music shows. I mean, they started, I guess back in 99 and it's they've happened on and off but there's like some theaters there's one in in london that has been having them consistently running since 2016 they're like amazingly popular i know i I, i've never brought myself to do that because i you know i'm not like obsessed (laughs) but but there was this woman in vienna i guess or somewhere yeah and she had she's like the guinness world was how do you say that Guinness Book of World Records? Yeah, Guinness Book of World Records, 940 times. Oh, my my goodness. goodness. That she had seen um, The Sound of Music. Wait, so what do you do with these things? You go and you just sing along? Is it like a Rocky Horror kind of a thing? Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. People, people like dress up out. like nuns and the kids and everything. Yeah, it's totally the same thing. And they thing. all get to sing Do Re Mi. They all get to <laughs> sing all of this, you know? So, um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Do they still go on? Do they still, are yeah, they still they're happy? still, it's still as popular. Like I said, there's this theater in London that's been doing it consistently, like since 2016. Like I am assuming it's a once a week, like every weekend or something. Yeah. yeah well, I will say, I'm just really glad that no one's ever yet wanted to remake it. Well, there was the, uh, the, the Sound of Music live version that was on TV, yeah, uh, 2013. Saying, yes, yes, yeah. yes. I know that was, but it was, okay. Well, that's so a different was that, thing. Was that that's the a different movie thing. or did they do the movie or the play? An adaptation based on the musical itself and not the 1965 film version. 
Yeah. So oh, so it go. was. Yeah. Well, you know, that's okay because it's television, you know? I mean. Well, I and it's the live thing. It, it, you know, they started this whole trend of these live annual yeah. things, which I, I love that they started doing that. I, I haven't been a fan of watching them because it's, I, I you know, it's a it's something I kind of struggle through with some of them. But uh, but I still love that they're creating that. It's it's kind of being, bringing people around to watch that. But still, if, yeah. if it's going to be the sound of music, this is the version I want to watch. Yeah, no, I think that um, I agree with you. Okay, so how did it do in award season, Andy? You know, it was pretty popular at the awards um, for for its time. It had 17 wins, 13 other nominations. Um, over at the Oscars, it ended up winning Best Picture, Best Director, Best Sound, Best Film Editing, and Best Music Scoring of a Music Adaptation or Treatment. I love when they had to have such complicated music categories at the Oscars. Um, the other nominations, Julie Andrews was nominated for Best Actress, but she lost to Julie Christie for Darling, which I've never seen. Um, yeah, me neither. Yeah, yeah. Again, going back to films that you talk about and films you don't, right? Um, Why didn't she win? Yeah. My hunch is that it was because she had just won for Mary Poppins the year before. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So um, Peggy Wood was nominated as uh, she was the uh, the head nun. Uh, she Did she win? For- she, no, she was nominated for supporting. Uh, she lost to Shelley Winters in A Patch of Blue, another one. I oh, that's seen. okay. Shelley Winters should have won. <laughs> she okay. was great in A Patch of Blue. <laughs> uh, best Color Cinematography, Best Art Direction, Set Decoration, and Best Costume Design all lost to Dr. Zhivago, which... Um, oh, well. It was the curtain. I can see that. Yeah, I can too. I can see. <laughs> the Ice Castle, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. What about uh, what about in the budget? I mean, I, you know, we've been uh, since we've been talking about performance. Obviously, this thing uh, did pretty well. Yeah, Robert Wise had eight point two million dollars to make his epic musical, which is about sixty two point six million in today's dollars. The Whoa. movie opened. Yeah, I know. Uh, it seems so low for a film like this. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, the movie opened March second, nineteen sixty five, initially as a roadshow theatrical release, uh, and then expanded across the country. Critics were mixed on it, but it did become an instant hit, and in just four weeks, had become the number one box office, number one movie at the box office, and became not only the highest-grossing film of the year, but one of the most profitable films out there. In fact, by November of 1966, it had become the highest-grossing film ever, beating out *Gone with the Wind*, a position which has wow. held for five years. Wow! Up, I am right. I know. Uh, it ended up breaking box office records in 29 other countries and had its initial initial theatrical release in the U.S. for four and a half years. That blows what? my mind. Wow. Wait, 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 wait a minute. You could go see that in a movie theater yes. for four and a half years? Can you believe that? But in <laughs> late 1969, you could still go see The Sound of Music in theaters. <laughs> Oh my goodness! I, I just, just watched I a Wrinkle even... in Time in my house. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's like shocking. Yeah. I didn't right. know that. I wow. That's well, amazing. if you think about it, they had no other way to watch movies. So if, yeah. if you wanted to go see a movie, that was it. So yeah. Uh, and in some cities in the United States, the number of tickets sold uh, exceeded the total population of the city. <laughs> so. <laughs> It is that's crazy. People, that's because people were seeing it three and four times. Exactly. Exactly. Um, it did have two subsequent re releases in 1973 and 1990, which have all been very successful. All told, the movie raked in $163.2 million domestically. And it was, in fact, the first film to gross over $100 million at the box office. It was Sound of Music. Yeah. Right? It was, wow. yeah. and uh, in uh, it, it grossed 123 million internationally, giving it a total adjusted gross of just under 2.2 billion. <laughs> very oh successful. God. And when you look That's at all time, oh when, when you look That's at all time adjusted domestic gross, this film is just behind Gone with the Wind and Star Wars. So, so those so are the top three. Those are the top three uh, for domestic adjusted gross. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it lands so, the film at a profit to cost ratio of nearly 35% of what it made back. And it gave it an adjusted profit per finished minute of $12.2 million. $12.2 oh million dollars a minute. So don't you wonder, don't you wonder if the studio thinks it's in profit and they should be starting to pay people now? Yeah, right? <laughs> you know what? Weirdly, I, I don't actually wonder that. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, they've still found ways to make it sound yeah, like it lost. Exactly. No, I'm telling you. <laughs> that that was disappointment doing... of the sound of music. I know, right? That two point billion. Well, maybe we should start, you know, paying uh, out people. <laughs> but oh, so God. funny. Well, this I'm is... so excited to know that it did so well. 
Oh, right. Oh, what an auspicious pick. I, I think it, at this point, we should probably get to the uh, the most contentious part of the show where we rank it. Absolutely. Oh. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. You'll see the the all of the films we've talked about on this show. Uh, or if you swipe over in your show notes, you will see the word flick chart. Go ahead and tap on it. It'll take you right to flick chart uh, to this movie where you can add it to your list and see how it stacks up against ours. Uh, very excited to see how this works. All right. First up, we have The Sound of Music or Star Trek Beyond. <laughs> Oh, is that the one with no that's not the wrath of Khan, right <laughs> no star no. trek beyond is the most recent one okay so sound of music sound of music for me too yeah the sound of music or predestination in a <laughs> little time travel or uh, uh time bending movie sound of uh, music. i can go sound of music yep sound of music for me too the sound of music oh speaking of Catherine's or star trek 2 the wrath of Khan. <laughs> <laughs> oh well i did like the wrath of khan but sound it of music. <laughs> uh, i'm gonna go sound of music yep sound yeah, of music the sound of music it's getting tough now or all the president's men oh sound of music i i liked all the president's men i really did i thought it was good but, but i think it, yeah. all, sound of music as a whole is a better movie I'm going to say Sound of Music, Pete. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a principled loss. I would have chosen uh, All the President's Men. Just it's it's there in my heart. But I am I don't feel bad about losing. There you go. <laughs> okay. Okay, you right. can be the outlier. <laughs> yeah. You're the outlier. The Sound of Music or Die Hard. <laughs> oh, wow. Two opposing. <laughs> Two well, annual Christmas movies. So like, let me ask you something. Am I on a deserted island with one TV set and these are my choices? Yes. Right. Yes. Well, you know, I'm going to, I'm always going to want to be uplifted. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to choose Sound of Music. Andy? I think for this one, I'm going to go Die Hard. <laughs> I am. I love Die Hard. It's so good. But I, I just can't. I mean, it's no, no, going to be totally really, really totally tough you. to get me to change from Sound of Music. This is a, though, yeah, yeah you have to just uh, know where this movie is for Andy and I in our youth. And uh, oh. I think die. I think I'm gonna have to go Die Hard too. Just okay. Just because I, of that. I I respect that. I do. I respect it. Very much uh, are, are growing up with that one. Of a uh, this yeah. is a this is an interesting pairing. So one brings you up, and one really brings you down. <laughs> the Sound of Music or Requiem for a Dream. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. Well, uh, I'm gonna go with the Sound of. I'm hands down the sound of music. I, yeah, sound of music for me. A, a Requiem is a, is an amazing and powerful film, but whew, boy, does it beat you up. Yeah. The sound of music or touch of evil, little Orson Welles. Oh, sound of music. I didn't think touch of evil was all that great. I thought it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Orson Welles is a genius. I mean, you know. Or... Uh, I'm, well, I'm I feel like I'm going to say "Touch of Evil," too. but now I feel I feel embarrassed saying that. <laughs> <laughs> you, can say, you can say "Touch of Evil." I just remember the shadows. Yes. Well, hey, I'm, I am say? "Sound of Music," so. All right. Well, there yeah. you go. Principled loss. The sound of music or Groundhog Day. Oh, oh dear, no, that's tough. That really tough. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I have to say the sound of music, but I did think Groundhog. I thought Bill Murray was so good. It's such a great movie. Oh, I, I think I'm. And I, I think just I'm saw Groundhog that Day, you guys. Hmm? What, what, I think that? I'm Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. Yeah. Well, I, I want one of them to be because it deserves one vote. Yeah. Well, maybe yeah. even two. Yeah, I, right, I'm going to huh? give it to Groundhog Day too, which I okay. feel really guilty about. I, I know. So no, it don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty. It's all right. <laughs> well, that one is weirdly. I feel my mother judging me. Is that weird? <laughs> <laughs> Like, because I know she would be, she'd be reprimanding me for, for no. picking anything over sound of music. <laughs> no, but I think, I think it's okay because, you know, it's funny. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Well, that puts the sound of music at, at spot 14 on our chart out of 358 wow. movies. So it shot wow. way up to good. the top. So, absolutely. <laughs> Great pick. Well, I just, I hope this conversation has encouraged your audience to see a wrinkle in time and to see the sound of music. Absolutely. If you had to give this uh, a star rating out of five stars, I'm assuming you'd give it five stars, but just to I be on the safe side. I think I think that's an honest, good assumption. I mean, I think okay. that you let me listening to this conversation. Oh, uh, wonderful, wonderful. Andy, that well, probably Catherine, means you, you're right about two and a half stars, right? Because, you know, you probably have some quibbles. <laughs> I think uh, uh, yes, five stars I would give around. it a firm five stars and yeah. a like. So I'm way up there with this one. 
All oh, right. you guys are so nice. Usually people just like make fun of me for liking the sound of music. And it what? seems like you liked it, too. Oh, no, the, absolutely. This is a great pick. This is oh, a great good. pick. It's oh, it's good. an annual favorite. The, something the whole family just loves to watch. So it's oh, it's really a, a fantastic <laughs> one to pick. And I think I, I told say, you we had just I should done say, it. Also, D. Wallace was on the show. You know, D. Wallace. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, and and she called both Andy and I a couple of wussies. So I don't know if that <laughs> if that plays into it. <laughs> Why we love it so much. You're not supposed to keep telling people that, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I think you know. Look, you give cover. I mean, one of the things you know sometimes. You give cover to people who um, are too shy to like admit that they like it. And so if you like it, then it's like, okay, for someone else to say, oh, yeah, I liked it too. Absolutely. <laughs> That's good. Absolutely. That's a yeah. gracious way to put it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, Catherine, are you on social media? Like, do you, are you out there in the social I, circles? If people um, want to I find am you, in, in, in a limited way, made by hand five and Twitter. Made by yeah. hand five. Yeah, made by hand. Is five. that the number five? Yeah, made by gotcha. hand five. Twitter. I mean, Ava DuVernay is the queen of Twitter, and <laughs> during the production, I'm telling you, she is yeah. really um She's everywhere. And uh, so during production, she was always posting and all, and you know, we all just felt like we were just luddites that we knew nothing, and <laughs> um, so she kind of taught us all how to like have a handle and post things and I, I must say you know now that I'm kind of more aware of it it's fun yeah, although there excellent. are some people that use it that really do diabolical things with it like yeah. you know other people yeah there are I some say, awful people out there yeah. no terrible but it's yeah. fun and uh, so isn't that the only oh an Instagram but I, oh, I don't really that's only for like I do with my family oh okay well we'll just we'll post the twitter we got you on twitter yeah, that's perfect yeah. people want to so there. well guys this well, was so much fun yeah thank you so much for joining us Catherine. we had such a fantastic conversation with you really appreciate Aww, your time thank you me too and go and tell your friends to rent or buy a wrinkle in time absolutely <laughs> noted Definitely all the links out. we'll put all the links in the show notes uh to check out uh, uh Catherine's good work uh, and uh, and thank you so much Catherine. you're a delight and uh, thanks for putting up with you. all of our shenanigans <laughs> i loved it i loved it and for everybody else out there we hope you enjoyed the show if you like what you heard but you can't wait until next week's show you can support us over on patreon.com slash the next reel to get involved in more stuff you can also learn about us at thenextreel.com. You can subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app or follow us on Instagram and Facebook at The Next Reel. Thanks for tuning in to The Next Reel, everybody. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. I'm going to use you to be my friend. It's hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great conversations over the years about so many great movies. All that said, producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. Becoming a Next Real member gives you access to all sorts of additional and exclusive content. Plus, you're helping us keep the lights on. Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership, where you can learn more about becoming a member, which costs a measly $5 a month, practically the same as one fancy coffee drink. And you get so much more. Every month, we record a bonus episode exclusively for members. Those episodes cover movies from whatever series we're covering at the moment or add to previous series. Some movies we've covered that only members get to hear us discuss include The Blues Brothers, The Russia House, Naked Lunch, Independence Day, the Hot Rock. And Relic, the better one. Plus, members get to vote on what we're going to discuss for those episodes. We also record additional pre- and post-show content in regular episodes that only members get to hear. Like conversations about similarly themed movies. And answering listener questions from our live member chat. Speaking of our live member chat, we record almost all of our episodes in Discord, where members can chat right along with us live. Members get access to other members-only channels in our Discord community as well. On top of all that, members get all episodes a full week earlier than everyone else in a private Next Reel feed just for them that includes all the shows in the Next Reel family. The Next Reel, the film board, movies we like, sitting in the dark, and more new projects on the way. To top it all off, members don't have to listen to ads. 
We've already eliminated those annoying, dynamically inserted ads that, let's face it, we all hate it. We are listening to you. We love podcasting for a living, and those ads help to pay the bills. Now, we're counting on you, dear listener. We promise we aren't going back to those terrible, dynamically inserted ads that don't relate to us at all. All we ask is that you consider supporting the next real family of podcasts with a membership. Again, it's $5 per month or $55 per year. Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership. Thenextreel.com slash membership. Get your access to early ad-free episodes with bonus content, member bonus episodes, and access to member channels and live streams in Discord by signing up today.